Welcome to <coughs> Chit and Chat. Uh, this is episode four, and we are so excited to have our uh, friend and colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Elaine Yao, who is going to present on, uh, maybe on a show, but sort of at least related to sort of uh, American uh, sort of textile art. Uh, we'll, well, she, she will tell us more about exactly what she's presenting. Uh, and I am currently in Baton Rouge. Uh, great to see you guys. It's great to see you, Elaine and William, of course. Always great. I'm still here in Aspen, Minnesota. Um, and it's a beautiful kind of rainy day. Um, but yeah, we're doing well, staying healthy. I, um, I'm in Redwood City, California on the peninsula. Mm -hmm. uh, San Mateo County, which I think is the fourth has the fourth infection, fourth largest infection rate for COVID-19. Um, but we are all staying very safe uh, and it's a gorgeous day. It's sort of um, tragic that every day, as you two both know, in the Bay Area is a steady 65, 70 degrees and sunny, but um, we're enjoying the, uh, the driveway a lot these days. Some sun, that's good. Yeah. yeah. So uh, let's talk about what we're drinking. Uh, I'm actually drinking Puar, uh, which is a fermented Chinese tea in a beautiful cup that was made by a little known artist named Sanjit <laughs> Sati, who is the husband of uh, Kristen, uh, that I received many years ago. Uh, I added a little bit of chrysanthemum flowers, as, uh, which is something that uh, Southern Chinese people like to do with their You puer. add the cr chrysanthemum flowers to the Puar? Is it Puar yeah. or Puar? Say the puar, puar. puar. Do you puar. add the flowers to the puar? When what yeah. like, adds a more floral note? I yeah. Like puar yeah, yeah. Is so smoky, like the single malt of it. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a little smokiness, and you know, historically, they actually add chrysanthemum, chrysanthemum flower to a range of things, including uh, a longjing, which is this sort of really young green tea. Mm -hmm. uh, but people haven't really been doing that. Uh, so, yeah. Cool. And that's a nice tea bowl. I'm glad. Yes. You Yes. I always like the little fingerprints from where you Yeah. <laughs> little marks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's fun. I'm drinking out of this not quite as beautiful cup here. It's a travel mug built for speed, <laughs> for functionality. Um, and I'm not drinking just Zen green tea. <laughs> well, <it's> a, <laughs> I, I was nice. drinking PG tips all morning and I felt like I needed to step back and go a little bit lighter on the caffeine. So yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I, um, let's see, I have my mm. trusty museum mug with a Ooh. wood carved squirrel. Um, but I am drinking today uh, mother's <laughs> milk tea. Um, <laughs> so just to clue you in that, yes, I am. Um, nursing an infant and it um it's actually very pleasant it has anise coriander cumin huh. seeds um fenugreek and all of these things that um support milk production fenugreek so is a it's a big one i remember ingesting a lot of fenugreek during that period of my life <laughs> well <clears throat> I know it's crazy. Um, I, I mean, the idea that you could sort of boost what your body is doing just by these things. Nice enough that you can um, drink it any day, but I don't know, William, I'll leave that up to you. Can you tell <laughs> I'll try it. The, the, squir the little wood carved animal on your mug? Sure, it's a squirrel and it's actually from the Milwaukee Art Museum uh, from the Michael and Julie Hall collection of folk art. Um, it was actually a gift, um, and so it has sentimental value also. That's great. Would you like to talk about, uh, introduce, start introducing what you, you would like to talk to us about? Yeah, absolutely. And um, let me just say first, thank you both so much. It's so great to be reunited with you guys. Um, and also um, to talk about quilts and textiles, which is a bit of a new a medium for me, although I've been researching it for the past year and a half or so. Um, so I know, Kristen, textiles are your thing, so I'm excited to start this conversation with you. Some of the objects, actually all of the objects that I'll be talking about briefly today, come from an exhibition that I co-curated uh, just about a few months ago at the UC Berkeley Art Museum Pacific Film Archive uh, with the director Larry Rinder, and it's a uh, 
on the work of Rosie Lee Tompkins. It was a retrospective exhibition. Um, and I'm not really sure how well known she is um, to many people. I think in the contemporary art world, she's been sort of on the radar, on the up and up, um, most recently featured in the Outliers and American Vanguard Art Show. Um, but definitely among, uh, in the Bay Area, she is fairly well known just because she lived and worked in Richmond, which is in the East Bay. Um, but that's to say, um, so to kind of take on the, the graphic that I know you two have had for the past couple episodes, um, I named this one Piecing Textiles, and I wanted to leave it somewhat vague because Rosie Lee Tompkins, her work has been traditionally talked about as quilts, but then I hopefully, I think as I share a little bit more about the objects, um, they become less quilt-like in the very traditional romantic homespun sense. Mm -hmm. And I think um, kind of stretches how we think about quilt making and patchwork in different ways. Um, so I thought I might start, yes, here is the opening gallery shot of the exhibition, um, which I will say on the side, sadly, um, it's been closed because of all of the shelter in place. Um, but we're hopeful that um, at least maybe come July, um, it'll open, um, have another month or so. Um, what I'll share today comes a lot from the catalog essay that I wrote, um, which is here. Um, and I'll also share a link later on to a YouTube a YouTube link to a colloquium talk that I gave um, in case anybody else is interested. And because so much information is there, I'm, I'll really just sort of cherry pick for our talk today. Um, so the exhibition itself, as you can see, focuses on Rosie Lee Tompkins. Um, and it really commemorates the, um, the gift, the bequest to the museum of 3,000 quilts by African-American makers. Um, and she is by far the most represented within that collection uh, with about 500 artworks. So the museum was just really excited to sort of kind of launch the gift with this um, one person show. Um, just real briefly, here's Eli Leon. Um, he was based out of Oakland, uh, kind of a quirky eccentric guy as you might expect in sort of that Berkeley Oakland sense. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about him later and maybe more things will come up in the Q&A. But um, I just wanted to give you a sense of, this is the man who uh, gave the gift to the museum. Mm. All right, so, um, so onto this thing of piecing textiles. Um, you know, throughout the catalog essay and through the course of planning the exhibition, yes, we've, uh, the staff and I always talked about them as quilts, but, um, as we were writing and doing the research, clearly the um, phrases like patchwork, textile art, the way that her quilts approximate collage and other forms of piecing became more obvious. And so on this slide, I just wanted to give you a sense of what I mean. So on the left, I have um, something pretty typical of her work. Um, and the medium here is primarily velveteen, velvets, and velour. Um, with some kind of novelty fabrics thrown in there. But you can sort of see with these asymmetrical designs, um, the sawtooth, the, um, some of the bar, the bar designs, which for example, like right here, um, the sort of offbeat composition is really in contrast to, I think, what many people may have in mind as more traditional quilt making. And I just have two examples. Um, in the middle and on the right, just to make that clear. Um, so you can see here, we have um, four, four patches, uh, four patch blocks, but then um, kind of a pinwheel and half square pattern here. Mm -hmm. And then on this side, the bars around a central medallion. But um, there's a sense that there's some geometry, geometric order and symmetry in the design, which is something that is actually quite um, atypical for Rosie Lee Tompkins. And so um, I'll use the word quilting throughout the, um, the presentation, but I think um, I'll point out places where I think that um, that category can start to break down. Um, 
on that point, I should just mention, um, thinking about quilts in a very technical way, right? There's the pieced top, which is the visual design that we see. Um, usually there's a central layer of batting or the insulating layer, and then a backing. Um, and then the quilting process is when um, all three of those are sewn and sort of, you know, basted together. Um, a thing to know about Rosie Lee Tompkins is that um, she did not quilt many of her of her designs. And again, that has to do with Eli Leon and his collecting and the way that he um, commissioned other women to actually complete the quilting process. Um, so that's just sort of a brief word. Um, and here's another example when I when I mentioned earlier about how her quilting could almost approximate a kind of fabric collage. Here is one example of what I mean by that, where you have not only pictorial fragments being arranged together, but you can also see, um, which I hope becomes clear, is um, the stars and the stripes, the American flag that is being um, incorporated, but then sort of deconstructed and reconstructed using all matter of found fabrics. Um, and we can return to this, this quilt, which I think is really fascinating, but for example, just calling out here, they have some batik and um, kind of a Mexican style serape that is in that gray blue section. Um, okay, so let me give you a little bit of biography just so we're on the same page. Um, so Rosalie Lee Tompkins is actually a pseudonym. Uh, she was born Effie May Martin in 1936 in, um, in Arkansas, in rural Arkansas. Uh, she was one of 15 half siblings uh, born into the sharecropping system. Her family were, was a family of sharecroppers um, and cotton pickers. Um, and so much of her story really is shaped by the Great Migration. Um, so by 19, uh, 1958, she leaves Arkansas. And um, here's a map that I find is really helpful. And in doing the research, um, helped me appreciate much more just these migration patterns. And so where she is headed, she, you know, she's starting in this section of Arkansas. And then in 58, by way of Milwaukee and Chicago, comes out to the East Bay um, in Oakland and Richmond. Uh, we don't really know exactly um, her motivations for leaving, but, um, but like so many others, of course, economic, um, uh, economic opportunity, um, leaving the poverty of the South, um, leaving the Jim Crow oppression of the South, undoubtedly were factors. Um, but it's also likely that um, there were friends, family, other kinship networks that drew her out there. Um, in fact, in Richmond, um, there were about tens of thousands of native Arkans Arkansans, I guess you could say, um, who left the state and settled out there. So it's very likely that she had um, acquaintances, if not immediate um, family and friends out there. Um, so, right, so she arrives in California in 58, um, immediately enrolls in a community college and begins training and working as, um, as uh, an occupational nurse. Um, and then meanwhile, you know, she marries, raises a family, and then um, eventually turns back to quilting. Um, she learned quilting from her mother as a young girl, but again, really didn't pick it up um, until the, um, the 60s and 70s. Um, she would produce patchwork um, and pillows and other crafts um, and sell those at local flea markets all around the East Bay. Um, so here's an example of um, which I think you can sort of see how she is leaning on the sort of the template and the genre of quilt making and then um, sort of really interpreting that through her individual taste and style. Um, so on the left is actually the one example of a quilt made by her mother, Sadie Lee Dale, that we also received um, as part of the bequest. And on the right is probably one of her best known, most published um, uh, textile works uh, or quilts. Um, and I think you can sort of see some of the similarities. There is, um, although it's really faded, there is this sort of central block 
in the middle, kind of anchoring the middle, which is that medallion style, which is sort of that focal point in the center, which she's reinterpreted through these um, modulations of, um, of, velvet, of velvet triangles. And then surrounding it are, uh, is a border of bars, um, checkerboard patterns, and kind of, as you can see, quite improvisational. You know, there is no um, set pattern um, that one can make out. And you can see how she's sort of adapted that in this artwork too. Um, really beautifully with these blocks of bars up here, um, almost sort of smaller quilts within quilts in the way that they're bordered. Um, and so, um, the, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. I mean, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, let's see. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. So one thing I should, I wanted to mention, um, just in her choice of velvet, um, and sort of novelty fabrics, um, you know, I think many people have this idea of quilts as always being produced out of, um, out of necessity, out of found fabrics around one's home. I think what's really different for the Rosie Lee Tompkins story is that she is purchasing and selecting all of her fabrics mostly from um, what she's finding at thrift stores and flea markets um, and, and also um, purchasing new often um, in fabric stores as well. And so this idea that um, uh, the way that she's really chosen and favored a lot of velvet um, is indicative of the kind of, I think, artistic intention that is really guiding a lot of her work. Um, and I think you'll see a lot of the similar materials crop up again and again. So velvet being one of them. I regret not having a detail, but you can sort of see here, um, these are animal print and faux fur fabrics. Um, I'll go on here. Here's another example. Um, really this truly gorgeous black black and red velvet and i wanted to put these together because um there's a way that a lot of her work is guided by kind of her personal universe of meaning and in these two examples um the colors that she's chosen have take on personal meaning as far as family members that she was thinking about in in the making so the red and the black um, in some of the interviews that Eli Leon um, conducted with her, we know that she was thinking about her brothers um, in the making of the red and black example. Um, in the blue example, she often talks about blue as um, representative of, of one of her sons. And so I think there's a way in which um, these are um, functional objects, they're endowed with personal meaning, um, and in, in as much as they also are abstract artworks too. Um, just to give you a sense of uh, a lot of the photographs don't really do the, uh, the objects justice. And so I just have a couple of slides to show about um, why I think velvet was such an expressive medium for her. It really was something that she manipulated again and again. Um, so you can sort of see in this slide, just the sheer luminosity that velvet brings, um, it's, it both has this shine, but in the way that it can reflect light so differently, it can also absorb so much. So it creates a sense of, 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 um, of depth and sort of this softness. Um, you can also see in this example, the way that um, the texture of velvet in the way that the pile or the nap can also change the lighting, um, creates a different sense of opticality and patterning. Um, Let's see, I have this example here. You can see how she sort of is really unconcerned with having the fabric lay flat. And so you have this really sort of um, gorgeous puckering that comes at the seams that adds this other dimension to it, which um, you see again and again. Um, in this example, again, this is a detail, but um, you can see what's coming across in this slide is kind of this brownish thing the brownish sheen in the lower right really is the same black that is running through uh, the center. Um, and then sort of the, the sparkly, the sparkly pattern you see is um, paint, like a painted, like a manufactured painted um, sparkle paint on black velvet. And so you get this again, um, remarkable sheen and design that is really picked up by, by the turquoise blocks um, to the left. 
I think there was also, um, and we can talk about this too, uh, I think it'll be more dynamic in the Q&A, but just the tactility of Velvet as well, just sort of, I think it lends this sense of pleasure in the making, in the making and piecing, um, as well as I think it, even though these are all, I think I'd be, I'd be probably 80% confident in saying all of these are synthetic and manufactured velvets. But of course, I think historically velvet um, has been this luxury fabric. Um, and so I think this sense of specialness, um, uh, specialness really gets carried through. And I think um, Tompkins was really drawn to that specialness um, in creating her artworks. Here's just another example. Um, again, she was really, the way that I think we can think about how she's playing with sparkle and light and glitter really comes across and, um, in this fragment. And this is again, a velvet, velveteen um, backing with the black um, with some silks to the right. Um, back to this notion of, um, of personal meaning as it comes through quilts. Um, these two examples, stand out to me um, because, again, the, it's a color palette that she developed in thinking about distant family members. Um, it's called Three Sixes, and this is a name that she gave to the quilts herself. Um, and this purple, orange, yellow pattern, or palette, excuse me, um, all represent family members whose birthday all have the number six in them. So um, as I wrote in the slide, noted in the slide, her birthday is September 6, 1936. Um, and so she is represented in the quilt. Um, another individual who was always represented is her grandfather, um, Zebedee Bell, who was born in 1893, I believe, 1873. I might have to go back to the book to check. Um, and almost always another family member. And so there's a way in which the quilt um, is sort of gathering together um, distant and past members, but then unifying them um, in this single artwork, which to me is really poignant in thinking about quilts as coverings and the idea that one could one could bring one's ancestors close to you. Um, again, I think just as, I, just as you know, I'm thinking about her story in the context of the Great Migration and thinking about how she's reinforcing kinship ties through these. Um, and even today, we're in this strange place of social distancing, but there's a way in which we're all trying to stay connected to one another. And so I think um, it's, it's really sort of bringing a whole new um, sense to, uh, uh, to these works. Okay, and then finally, um, the last set of works that I'll talk about are um, these yo-yos, which again have personal meaning. Um, the yo-yos are these different colored rosettes that um, that are sort of stitched together, and she's she's applied to a green backing. Um, but in the top example, there are 68 yo-yos, each one representing a year in her life. So it represents the age at which she created um, the artworks, um, with a with a biblical scripture on the left her name, Effie, across the top, and her birthday. Um, in the example below, the, um, the six yo-yos are representative of um, the month, sorry, sorry, you can sort of see it. It's um, in commemoration to her cousin, Calvin, who was born on 10-6-33, and you can sort of see that roughly stitched. Um, and so these, again, are not, um, are not strictly quilts, at all, but these are, I think these are a, a genre or a body of work in her, um, in her art that really, I think helps us think about, she's really more of a textile artist than say a traditional or conventional quilt maker. Um, I think I'll just stop here for now. And I think the Q&A will bring out a lot more. Um, and I have some other sides and I'm happy to go back and forth to whatever um, was of interest to you or if I can clarify anything else. That was totally amazing, Elaine. Right? I'm so That was great. Thank oh, you. Thanks. Um, we, sat, we sat and we can't really see the exhibition. I know. I know. Fingers crossed though, it'll reopen. Yeah. But let me share my slides again just so we can be looking. Yeah. 
Right. So I'm happy to land wherever um, you'd like me to land. I right have now. one. I just want to kind of maybe this is like the obvious comment, but actually that's perfect. The one with the hidden myth strip. Um, mm. And then also I was thinking about it with the three sixes as well. This looks to me like kente cloth, right? Like it looks like strip woven mm. kente cloth. Is there... I don't know if you've looked what at it, that at all or... So the thing to know about Eli Leon as a collector, so he was not only a collector, but sort of to some degree self-taught, but a major mm -hmm. scholar of African textiles. Okay. Mm -hmm. And part of his extreme interest, not just um, in African-American quilt making more broadly, but also in um, Rosie Lee Tompkins, is because he really spent his life's work trying to make the historical connection between mm. African textile and what you're seeing. Mm. Um, so, so visually, I think your, your intuition um, and your sense is right on. Um, I think uh, what, what, was, what ended up being a little bit controversial about Eli Leon and his scholarship, however, was um, I think some of the, uh, the racial ideology that he brought to it in sort of codifying an African-American aesthetic. Um, but I think when, when you start to think about it more in terms of process, um, I think the, uh, the similarities become much more apparent. I think it's much easier to talk about similarities in technique and, and look. Um, so, so, I mean, because part of, I was thinking, so Kente cloth is from Ghana, as <laughs> so it is, but it's strip woven. And so what was striking to me was the, the way, at least in this hit and miss strip, how those strips of red and black really do seem to have a, a kind of aesthetic similarity to a lot of kente cloth. But I was actually wondering, so the Eli, the Eli Leon interest in African textiles is a really interesting one. I was wondering if she had seen, you know, she'd seen kente cloth or, or if you know what she, other kinds of textiles she might be seeing, if there was, not thinking about it in terms of like lineage or sort of racial identity, but in terms of textile objects she might have drawn inspiration from or that might be circulating in her world in the 80s mm -hmm. whenever she's working. yeah no I think um I would have to say yes I, I again I don't have um concrete evidence and you know this could be a question um for her family too her mm -hmm. she um her her son still lives in the east one of her sons still lives in the east bay and was really wonderful throughout um the research for the show. But, um, you know, she is in Richmond. She's in Oakland in the 60s and 70s. This is completely like Black power. Um, and I think uh, thinking about um, Black nationalism and the way that even Kenti cloth and some of these African textiles begin to take on that cultural currency in this time. So um, I would have to think like, absolutely, it's part of her, mm -hmm. part of her visual material world. Mm -hmm. um, there is one example, I don't have a slide of it, although it is published in the catalog of, um, of a larger quilt where you do see um, kind, different kinds of African textiles incorporated. I don't have the, um, the expertise to really uh, identify each of those, but I think just as different kinds of, um, of African fabric or even African styled patterned fabric um, is sort of all, again, I think part of that material culture of where she is in the East Bay the, in, the, in the 70s and 80s. Is the, you were saying that technically there might be some similarities. Was she making these in strips and then stitching them together? So yeah, yeah. I think right. from what we can tell, yes, that, that, that would be um, mm -hmm. exactly what she was doing. I think, I think it's more obvious, yes, in the red and black example. Um, in the blue example on the slide, I think you can see she is thinking in, um, in block. She's working in the block unit too. Yeah. That was actually another technical question I had was whether the, because um, you said that some of them weren't actually quilts. The, you, she wasn't quilting layers together. They were, it was the top piece that she was working on um, or that, that Leon commit, um, commissioned. And That's I was right. just curious to know if those pieces, and it was great when we were, I was trying to see if I could tell with those details of the velvet you were showing us, but mm -hmm. I was curious to know if those pieces were actually patched work together or if they're appliqued. Um, oh, good example. Yeah, so they are patchwork together. Okay. Yeah, so, um, and she did 
frequently, uh, mostly on her velvet, she is using a sewing machine. So mm -hmm. on some examples where, they're, where they are not backed, you can actually sort of flip them over and kind of see how they're um, seamed together. Yeah. Um, there are other examples, um, yeah, like this one, for example, which is applique, and you can see yeah. it's the, much more obvious here. Yeah. Well, it's so interesting too, you were talking about this tactility of velvet. The first thing I thought of was like, damn, velvet is so hard to work with. Like, how do you, you know, especially if she's doing a sewing machine, that stuff is just slipping, you know, slipping all over the place. So there's also like a, a technical prowess thing that, that comes up for me when I think about working with that, because that puckering is, Mm. Maybe it's intentional, but it's also because velvet just doesn't stay right. where you want it to in the same way that cotton, you know, that like a, you know, tabby woven cotton would or something like right. that. Yeah, precisely. And, and it's hard to know. I, um, just the way that so much of her art, especially the velvets, don't tend to lie flat. Mm. Um, makes me think that she either really welcomed sort of that slipperiness or sort of, you know, she sort of welcomed what that brought to the table, um, or it really wasn't a concern for her so much, sort of that, that precision that, right, we think of quilt making as sort of very technically exacting. That wasn't really a concern for her, and I think just adds so much sort of visual activity to whatever you're looking at. Well, I mean, you did, you did just sort of bring, bring up the applique materials, which I think he, she is very much thinking about this beyond just a two-dimensional design, but rather as a three-dimensional three with textures, with surfaces, and things like that. I mean, what, what you said about the distinction, and I absolutely agree with you, <laughs> to sort of further uh, uh, think about the issue of these as not a typical sort of quilting, including sort of things like the ace quilt, is that uh, usually, at least from my understanding, quilting, they're usually sort of done through different generations. There are little scraps of cloth or sort of things that people sort of put together. So the focus is on the memory or the meaning that were established with a specific fragments of textile that are then pieced together. Versus here, very much like a textile artist or a two-dimensional artist or a sculptor, uh, she creates meaning, she creates uh, uh, sort of symbols uh, and uh, uh, connections with the fabrics and material that she's working with, rather than the, the materials themselves already have an inherent meaning within the family history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th um, that's really great, William. And I think, um... I think that adds to, um, how do I say, and I use this word very cautiously, I guess the contemporaneity mm -hmm. of, um, of some of her work too, in terms of seeing how she is really thinking about her materials as materials, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but then again, later on, then adding sort of the personal symbolism or the numerology in the yeah. case of the three sixes example. Um, Can I maybe push back a little bit to this idea that by using, you know, taking old fabric or reusing fabric out of necessity is somehow less sort of artistically, mm. um, or has it sort of requires less artistic agency than purchasing fabric. And maybe that's not what you intend to say, but that's, Mm. I think that, I mean, there's so many great examples of quilting traditions all over the world where they were built out of necessity and out, out of the desire to reuse old fabric. You know, kanta quilts, for example, from Bengal, kojagi textiles from Korea that are so incredibly aesthetically beautiful um, that still have a desire for reuse. Um, but there's no doubt in my mind, or I can't imagine in anyone's mind, that there there isn't an enormous amount of creativity and artistic agency in the choosing and placing of the fabric. No, no, that's not what I mean at all. What I mean is just sort of the indexical meaning that, you know, you're touching a, let's say, a conventional quilt that I can think of, right? That you're touching the spot that your grandmother has sewn, or she grew up part of her blanket that she grew up with. There is that sort of inherent meaning that you get sort of attached to these sort of scrap and remnants that you can so you, you then place together versus 
uh, presumably, uh, I mean, some of these might have specific meanings, for example, the flags or the portraits of MLK and the two Kennedys, but other ones that she did purchase from the store, maybe for the uh, textile, uh, maybe for the surface sort of interest, maybe for the material interest, that do not necessarily have these type of family or personal history that were attached to them until she uh, is recreating them uh, or putting them into a sort of a piece like this. Yeah, and actually um, the, on, this, on this theme, um, one example really comes to mind that I think um, exemplifies how both of your points of view are, are, are at play in her work. Um, and that, again, I don't have a slide of it, but there is an example in uh, the De Young, and it is a denim patchwork quilt. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think if, um, so I guess in sort of the memory laden indexicality of that we think of in terms of quilt making, I can think of say a G's bend quilt in which say um, the work clothes of a beloved family member then becomes repurposed in a larger quilt. Um, so that's just one, that's on one end of the spectrum. On uh, the other end of the spectrum with Rosie Lee Tompkins, what she ended up doing in this one example is she purchased um, she purchased secondhand denim, um, created her own large patchwork, but then ended up embroidering the memory of her family members, um, namely her, her grandfather and her grandmother who were sharecroppers into this quilt. And so you have, so you have the, the personal memory um, and connection to her family, but on a set of secondhand material, mm -hmm. but it's still denim, which is symbolic of sort of the work clothes, right? And so I think there's, um, there's a way in which all of these dimensions are at play mm -hmm. at any given moment, mm -hmm. um, which I find um, really wonderful. I think also, I mean, it sort of strikes me too that even where, and it's hard to know what, like in this example, what is new fabric and maybe what's used fabric, and you'll have a better sense of that, Elaine, but it seems like even, some of the fabrics here, even if they're not taken from, you know, they're not used or not worn before, that they are referential to something else, right? And to their part exactly. of the modern era, the serape you mentioned, or, mm -hmm. you know, batik, or it looks like some kind of block printed Indian or Indonesian kind of textile that's in there, or something that's referencing that kind of look, in addition to something um, like the American flag, which has mm. um, such sort of uh, deep symbols and politics attached to it. But it, but it makes me think that, I mean, I, I appreciate what you're saying in terms of the indexicality in the sense that, you know, these objects have lives and this is sort of part of their biography and they're sort of appropriated into this new object and, and sort of carry with them that meaning. But I would, I would also push against that a little bit to say that even the newly manufactured textiles are perhaps referential of um, earlier textile traditions or other kinds of practices um, mm -hmm. if they're made you know, it made for the market, sure, and yeah. made, um, made anew. And, and they're made for, to be manipulated and to be sort of changed into clothes and whatnot too, right? So yeah, the, the, I don't want to say the empty, well, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Sort of, you mentioned something about um, Eli Leon's involvement. Mm. Were these all like, so how, which of these quotes did he actually commission and which ones were ones that she was making? You mentioned that some of them were like, they almost seemed like memorials or kind of like birth certificates or death certificates or sort of family, family trees in a way or sort of um, ways of recording mm -hmm. lineage. Um, were, so some of them seemed like they were personal and then others were commissioned by Leon just for- Yeah, so yeah, sorry, let me, Leah, let me clarify that. Um, so there's only one case sort of one, one body of work that I know of in which Leon actually, I, I, which we would recognize as a commission, right? So in, this, in these cases, he actually supplied her with fabric and said, you know, um, hey, Effie, I'd love for you to work with these materials. Um, none of what I've showed today are commissioned. So um, when, I, when I use the word commission, it's only in the context of Leon getting, enlisting other women to complete the quilting. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see, to do the actual quilting and the layout. Exactly, exactly. So actually all of, I would, I would very confidently say that all of her designs were strictly her own mm -hmm. with, without any intervention. I would say the degree of, of Eli Leon's intervention, of course, um, 
was was major in the sense that he, he they met in 1985 at a flea market. Um, he immediately was um, you know suspected that she was she was a quilter, um, and then eventually you know they built this um, this friendship, and um, so to to the degree that he showed extreme interest, he did purchase very quickly. Um, a majority of her works. So mm. he would often, you know, call her up and say like, hey, you know, how's that red and black thin one going? Are you almost done with that? Um, or I'd love to show this. And so he, so he would pay her, mm. you know, um, you know, pay her for her work. But um, as far as the design and her choices, um, they were, they were almost exclusively like largely her own. Okay. Mm. That's so interesting. Yeah. It just reminds me of something we were circling around before about just sort of the world of referentiality that each that these different fabrics have, mm. and then when you join them together, what do you what emerges as a result? Um, and that was part of the kind of the exhaustion, but the sheer like joy of working with these materials because again, just in this in this JFK MLK example. Um, just how you're able to kind of suture these this world of associations is part of the, the wonder of it. So even like, so this, the portraits um, in sort of offset, the off-center portraits, it's made of what I would just call like a novelty blanket. If you just think of those kind of like synthetic furry blankets you can buy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> like that's what that's made of. That's the material. Um, sort of that, that dark bar running down right next to JFK is um, if I remember correctly, it's, it looks just like a cotton muslin that mm. is a dark with like little hearts printed on it. Um, there's some sort of novelty fabrics in the uh, sort of the kind of like the parchment colored fabrics at the center top and below um, kind of have this colonial pastoral theme. Um, there, the, it's a Saint Ignatius. It's like a high school prep school jersey, right? Mm. And so you have these this world of associations and you're trying to kind of track with her. So like, what's what up with the number 55? Is that, or just, it looked like aesthetically it's interesting with the blocky mm -hmm. eyes and red. Right, like, like I'm not positive. This, this sort of text is a fragment. It has the serenity prayer printed on it, right? The like, help me accept the things that I can change and the wisdom to know the difference between the things I can't change. <laughs> and then the others, those other ones look to me like they're embroidered, right? Like the white one with the flowers. Yeah, like um, an embroidered fabric. I don't know if it is, or is it printed to look like embroidery? Or yeah, if memory serves, that is embroidered along mm. with the um, what looked like corn or carrot, like a sheaf of corn or the or carrots. I'm not exactly sure what that is, but that is also embroidered. Mm. Um, and as well as the the purple fabric with the flowers. Yeah. Um, there's which is interesting if it's not her embroidery right if she's taking exactly it's already been embroidered and already been sort of part of this world of stitching um and women's work um, precisely it's fascinating well we should probably wrap this up I know. <laughs> it's gonna, this is such a wonderful conversation we can I know, these are really really wonderful <laughs> great to see i hope the exhibition goes back up and yeah continues because um, they seem quite large. I bet they're quite stunning mm -hmm. in person. Yeah. Um, as you can see, like a lot of them really can, can anchor a large gallery wall. Yeah. Um, which, um, you know, Larry, my co-curator, um, he, he was the, the person to emphasize to me, you know, a lot of these quilts would, would not necessarily fit on a standard size bed. And yeah. so, um, she may or may not be thinking utilitarian, like functionality in terms of right. how she's making them, but again, sort of working within the genre, but just working on a very big scale and small scale too. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Elaine, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate, beautiful. I appreciate the invitation and just a chance to re-enter the world of uh, art historical talk. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.